You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Solana, Doge, and more. Cryptocurrencies and digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity, provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments throughout the world's leading crypto derivatives markets. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on The Crypto Rundown. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of crypto derivatives. It's time for The Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again, and it is time for the Crypto Rundown, the program here on the old network where we go beyond our traditional stomping grounds of, you know, your Tesla and your VIX and your spy options to see what's going on a little bit further afield in the crypto waters. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the T-H-E Options Insider.com, as well as from the network upon which so many of you our main lining these days. Welcome to all of our new listeners out there, including many of you coming from the realm of crypto who are maybe a wee bit new to the world of options. If that is you, then of course, make sure you're listening to the whole network. We have some great educational content there. Both of those shows have been running for over a decade, hundreds of episodes each. You can sit down, consume them on your own schedule. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you think you're ready to take that next step then head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. Once you're there, of course, 100 plus episodes waiting for you on that exclusive pro podcast feed. More coming every week out there, including Options Oddities, which gives you a chance to break down some of the interesting, unusual activity that's been catching our eye during the week, as well as great educational content like our pro Q&A sessions. We give you the chance to pick the brains of some of the best names in the world of options and derivatives. Of course, a lot of them dovetailing in the world of crypto as well. So a lot of fascinating stuff to be found at theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. A lot of fascinating stuff to break down on the show today, including Bitcoin back above 30000 I know a lot of you are excited about that. But before we get there, it is time to roll out the crypto hot seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the, the Crypto, crypto hot, hot Seat. All right, everyone, welcome to the Crypto Hot Seat, the portion of the show where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you. The listener and today's guest is a newcomer to the program and indeed to the network. He is David Wells, the CEO of Enclave Markets. David, welcome to the Crypto Rundown program. Hey, Mark. 
Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. All right, David, as we are wont to do with all of our first timers here on the program and indeed on the network, why don't you go ahead and give our audience a bit of an overview of your background in the financial markets and indeed the crypto space, as well as what it is you do day to day over there at Enclave Market. Sure. That sounds great, Mark. Really appreciate it. So, so yeah, I have kind of a mix of uh, in my background of both traditional finance and also um, new, new markets such as the crypto markets. Um, so let's see. So I've been we started on Clave Markets in early 2022 uh, and I'll get into to what we're doing there. But prior to that, I was in uh, the quantitative hedge fund space at a, a firm called Two Sigma uh, in New York and was there for for a couple of years. Um, got my start into the crypto space in 2017 at a company uh, in New York as well called Paxos Trust, where I ran the crypto exchange there, as well as some of the um, some of the product launches that they have in the stablecoin space, uh, tokenized assets, and then retail brokerage integrations. 2017, a hot time to get into the crypto space, of course. We had CME <laughs> right. and we had SIBO both launching futures. It was kind of when crypto really broke into the mainstream for a lot of people out there in the trading world. We, of course, launched this show, I think, right around the beginning of 2018, so shortly thereafter, as it's still the newcomer to the network for me, even though it's been running for, for a while now out there. And then, of course, you're running Enclave Markets over there these days. Tell us, what is Enclave Markets? Yeah, absolutely. So Enclave Markets is an institutional-grade uh, digital asset marketplace uh, at a very high level. Um, we're sort of a hybrid, if you're familiar with uh, you know, DeFi and, and sort of what we call CeFi model or the more centralized model. We're a bit of a hybrid there um, where we sort of take principles and technology uh, that enables uh, the performance of a, a centralized off-chain private marketplace, uh, but principles of decentralization when it comes to market integrity, security, uh, and governance, and things like that. So it's it's a model that we call the fully encrypted exchange, or, or FEX. Um, and the idea is we're using a technology called Secure Enclaves, and our, our name is, is Enclave Markets based on that. Essentially, we've built the, the code base for an exchange or marketplace inside this encrypted environment, and we secure that through a network of a third party independent of testers, which sort of removes that single point of failure that you typically have in an otherwise centralized model. So there's a lot of benefits around privacy. Um, we've launched a couple of marketplaces, all currently in the spot world uh, to start. But we do believe, you know, in the future, uh, derivatives will be a, a big growth uh, area uh, as well. So happy to happy to go into our, our first couple of products that we've launched in the, in the spot world as they're pretty differentiated in this marketplace. Yeah, we'll get into all that. I just want to clarify for our listeners, because what you're talking about is, is a fascinating area of the crypto space. Obviously, we deal with a lot of exchanges in our traditional content on the network. So the listed world, the centralized world is very familiar to us and to a lot of our listeners. And of course, for a lot of our crypto native listeners who are coming strictly through the world of crypto, the decentralized world is normal to them. And the notion of centralization, that's all anathema to them. So one of the interesting areas for this program to explore for years now has been where those two worlds intersect, where those Venn diagrams overlap, you know, the centralized with all the regulation and the controls and the risk protections there and the decentralized world where no one person can get in the middle of the, the single point of failure, as you call it. They don't have that there either. Both have their benefits, both have their drawbacks. So a lot of people have been attempting to Merge those two worlds. It sounds like that's exactly what you're up to here. Was that really the genesis of Enclave Markets trying to bring, you know, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, two great tastes that taste great together and try to merge them into one thing here, David? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So um, we're the, the idea initially came out of we're incubated by a company called Ava Labs, which started the Avalanche Protocol. Um, however, we're, we're an off-chain and sort of multi-chain uh, marketplace, so we can really integrate with with any settlement platform. And that's kind of how we consider uh, using, you know, public blockchains. We also integrate with uh, with Web2 or more traditional uh, financial infrastructure settlement platforms. Um, and the basic idea is, is exactly what you said. So bringing together what are the, the benefits of the centralized model are you get, you know, you have guarantees around uh, privacy. You have uh, high performance, high throughput uh, in, in sort of the off-chain order flow. But then, uh, you know, the, the trade-offs there is that you might have a, a centralized uh, operator where, you know, there's varying levels of oversights and you have uh, sort of, you know, the potential counterparty risk. Um, so what we've done is taken this secure enclave technology. Um, we essentially uh, create a, a system where the only way to access or change uh, any contents of that um, environment is through a quorum of these external attesters. And uh, they essentially will approve changes, and that essentially removes us as the sort of operator 
um, of, of an otherwise sort of uh, centralized off-chain marketplace. So you can't have an SBF in the middle there gumming up the works. That, that's exactly the idea. I mean, we started this, uh, you know, several months before FTX. But of course, you know, going back to Mt. Gox, there's been uh, <laughs> man, many number of, of issues with, with the centralized model. But at the same time, coming from traditional, you know, finance world, I know the importance of, you know, sort of having privacy on your order flow, having high throughput, um, you know, and having a, a scalable uh, sort of marketplace. So the idea was to bring both of those together. I should also mention, you know, in the in the DeFi space, there's questions around, you know, how can institutions enter when there's varying levels of uh, sort of compliance and transaction monitoring. We've implemented, we've been able to implement those things, such as, you know, know your customer and transaction monitoring, any money laundering. All of those controls are implemented in this model as well. Um, but uh, we are integrated with various different chains. Um, we use the decentralized, you know, security system, and then also our authentication. Um, method is also through sort of like a Web3 login with your, your wallet of choice. So you essentially own your credentials uh, to entering the platform. Well, we are all living in a post-FTX world. That must have been a wild ride for you guys about exactly a year ago now when all this, this news was breaking with FTX. So what was the response to your offering in that world? Were people blowing up your phone? Were they saying, hey, we really want this approach that kind of merges the two? Or maybe were they a little bit reticent because you are kind of bringing some of that centralization to the table where they just, we don't want anything to do with anything centralized anymore. What's been the response to Enclave in the post FTX world? Sure. Yeah. I think it's, it's been fairly positive. I mean, when we were first pitching this in a, in the pre FTX world, uh, people sort of understood the benefits, but um, it wasn't super tangible because it'd been several years since we, you know, had a, a large, a large blow up like a platform like that. Um, but, but following that, you know, describing the different types of external controls we have, we have a process called external attestation, where essentially the attesters can uh, cryptographically ensure that the code base hasn't uh, been tampered with. Um, all of those messages started to really resonate a lot more. And, you know, the messages around market integrity, I think, you know, being a lot of exchanges are sort of running uh, proprietary trading strategies on their own, which presents a different type of counterparty risk. Uh, we're not doing any of that. We also integrate with external custodians so that, you know, you can uh, ensure that your funds are safe. So I think those messages really started to resonate a lot more uh, after we saw, you know, the issues with with FTX. Um, of course, there's a big reputation hit just from the industry in general, where traditional institutions that were maybe dipping their toe into the space um, had kind of pulled back and became more cautious just because they weren't sure how much of, you know, what happened with FTX was related to just pure, you know, traditional, uh, you know, financial fraud, frankly. Um, or was it something more specific or intrinsic to to the crypto world? And I think we're finally, you know, answering that question that it wasn't something specific to the crypto world. It was just somebody, you know, there was an opportunistic uh, player there that took a, took advantage of, uh, of of the market. A lot we can discuss about FTX, but I want to get into what you're bringing to the table over there at Enclave as well. So you started to mention some of your spot offerings. Give our listeners a rundown. What can I trade right now at Enclave? Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of different marketplaces uh, right now that are that are sort of differentiated. So the first uh, product that we went live with late last year is called Enclave Cross. And this is uh, more along the lines of like an OTC uh, model. It's uh, crossing networks and crossing engines have been something that existed in in equities and foreign exchange for, for many years now. But the idea is that uh, you can have uh, it's essentially a, a dark pool marketplace where it's everybody's permission who's on the platform. But you can submit orders uh, in larger sizes without having uh, any issues of information leakage. Um, so that order is not going to be visible to the rest of the world. Um, and then all of the trades are filled at a midpoint market price. It's essentially you can think of it as an index price that we use uh, of external venues. So it's not actually that that pricing is not impacted by any trades uh, that happened on Enclave Cross. Um, and that's that's been very popular in, in the, the OTC world for being able to so, sh- sort of not show larger sizes, but put in larger larger order sizes and get those filled at a midpoint price. Typically, the best scenario is where you have a natural buyer, a natural seller who come in uh, and cross each other. This is used most commonly in uh, mutual funds and ETFs in the in the traditional equity space. And as the crypto institutional market uh, has matured, uh, we've seen more and more interest for that product. So that's our first product called Enclave Cross. And then the, the second product is Enclave Spot, which is a more traditional central limit order book. And we have a, a lit version of this where you can see the order book, but still all built within the secure Enclave. And then we have a confidential version of this where you don't see the order book. And this is more the value prop is stronger for sort of, you know, buy side funds who don't want to reveal their, their full order size. Uh, and then those trades that are filled are not reported externally. So we have a couple of different models uh, that have been particularly attractive to, to institutions. 
say the lion's share of the volume is going up right now through the crossing side or going through the more uh, traditional limit order book side? Yeah, so far, uh, the majority of, of the volumes have been through through Enclave Cross, although that's, you know, that's been around a, a bit longer uh, with Enclave Spot and, and the, the confidential limit order book. That's been around just a few months, so we're just sort of getting that ramped up and going. But we expect both to be uh, have pretty strong uh, traction. Now, you're aimed squarely at the institutional markets, and this is another area we've been exploring ever since the onset of this program back in the crazy early days of 2018, is what really is the institutional interest in the crypto space. Obviously, back then, post-2017 into 2018, everyone and their mother and their grandmother had to have a piece of the crypto space. Bitcoin was exploding to record levels. Everything was going crazy. Then, of course, we got into one of our legion of crypto winters. Subsequently, we saw the interest somewhat wane. Uh, Apparently, everyone's back in today here, David, because Bitcoin's back above 30,000. But do you think that really, at the end of the day, the interest really just correlates so the price to spot Bitcoin, Bitcoin's up. Everyone's excited. Everyone wants to get back in. Bitcoin's languishing around sub 10,000. All of a sudden, people are washing their hands of it. Or is there they're more into it in terms of the level of institutional interest? What are you really seeing and hearing from the institutions out there right now in terms of their level of interest in the crypto space? Yeah, I would say like you're you're definitely right in the in the in the short term. You see a lot of uh, interest, you know, wax and wane based on you know price action and whatever the latest headline is. Um, so that so you do see some some volatility there, just in terms of interest, especially from more you know traditional funds uh, that are sort of interested in it. They, maybe they have strategies that they think could work well in crypto markets, but they're kind of you know hot and cold based on uh, whatever the headline is of the day or whatever whatever price is doing. But I do think that there's a longer term trend, uh, you know, going back to, you know, 2018 timeframe when when the futures came out of, uh, you know, this is going to be a long term asset class. And this is something that's, you you know, not not 100 percent correlated with other asset classes. Just from a portfolio diversification standpoint, it makes sense to have an allocation here. And it's, you know, it's still even though it's been around whatever, you know, 13, 14 years, it's still a relatively new asset class. And so if you're a, you know, mid frequency quantitative fund or if you're a long short directional um, there, there are opportunities uh, from an alpha perspective in this market uh, that you know existed probably 15, 20 years ago in, in equities and, and other asset classes. So I think we, we do see more and more, especially as sort of the, the infrastructure uh, is developed for the, to serve those institutional clients. So for example, being able to you know, have your funds at a custodian but trade uh, at an exchange, uh, that's something that's relatively new that, that we've been working on. Or, you know, the existence of a prime broker that is able to net out your positions, um, you know, across different venues. I think those are all positive developments that uh, lowers the barrier and increases the interest uh, longer term for institutions that are, you know, for the most part, you see smaller, um, more nimble, uh, more flexible, you know, hedge funds uh, and trading firms get into the space. But obviously, over the last, you know, six months or so, we've seen the largest asset managers in the world also indicate their, their long term you know, interest uh, in this space. So I think you're starting to see uh, a lot more of a swell, especially as we get through sort of the FTX trial and all those things. I think, um, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot more investment long term from an infrastructure perspective that will enable more institutions to get into the space. Well, you mentioned brokers and indeed the infrastructure. One of the things that's always puzzled me about the, the crypto space and in the realm of traditional finance, we have brokers And we have exchanges and never the twain shall meet. Whereas in the crypto space, those lines are, I think to call them blurry is charitable. We've had a legion of exchanges come on this program who call themselves exchanges, but really are brokers at the end of the day. They're out there acquiring new customers and they're onboarding their customers and they provide the front end custody of the assets and all the things that you would traditionally associate with a broker is the role that they're playing, even though they're masquerading as an exchange. And they do offer some of that functionality as well. They're providing pools of liquidity, but I think to call them exchanges is, again, charitable out there. Do you think we need maybe to drive more institutional adoption in the crypto space? Maybe we need to also clarify those barriers a little bit where the brokers are here and the exchanges are here and maybe maybe try to draw some more lines of distinction, David? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, there's, as in traditional markets, there's a reason that you have a separation of you know, the, the, the retail facing brokerage, you have prime brokers that are, you know, more basically the traditional banks that are, you know, extending leverage and, and giving uh, more sophisticated, you know, products and instruments, things like that. And then you have your market makers and your custodians, and they, they all sort of, you know, serve a different purpose, and they have uh, different incentives and things like that. And so we have uh, a term that we that we use a lot called composable infrastructure, which is 
you know, we're, we would like to be able to integrate with all of the different, you know, infrastructure providers, whether it's order routers, uh, you know, prime brokers, custodians, um, and then, of course, the traditional liquidity providers. Um, but, uh, but, but we really just want to be the, the marketplace, you know, in the middle. And so I think that's probably the direction that, that we're moving. Um, you know, in, in the beginning, it was just such a, a, a new space, a new asset class that you ended up with these like highly vertically integrated uh, platforms. And I think we're now moving to the point where we can mature and sort of, you know, be able to to have those lines of communication open between all of the different uh, infrastructure providers there. Well, I mentioned we're actually north of 30K right now in Bitcoin. We did a bit of a head fake last week as well, right up to the 30K limit and then right back down again, of course, on the heels of that false report that the uh, the iShares spot ETF, the one everyone's been waiting for, uh, finally got approved. So a bit of a head fake out there for the listeners last week, David. What were your thoughts as you were watching all this unfold in the space last week? Obviously, having uh, footholds in both spaces, the centralized and the DeFi space, uh, they both offer different solutions to that problem. What were your thoughts on, on all this, these false rumors flying fast and furious last week and the crazy price action that we saw as a result? Yeah, totally. I mean, it definitely shows you that there's still a discount in the market out there to, you know, the uncertainty of uh, of an ETF approval. But um, it's a great example of sort of, you know, by the rumor. It was literally just a rumor and, uh, and there's was, there was a lot of buying there. But I think what, what stood out most to me was the fact that uh, Larry Fink from BlackRock, you know, came on and, and basically, I mean, he, you know, he was more of a Bitcoin evangelist than, than I've seen. And, uh, you know, a lot of other, a lot of other traditional, uh, you know, Bitcoin evangelists in terms of the long-term viability of, of this as an asset class. Um, and then, you know, shortly after that, Bloomberg came him out and said 90% chance of approval this year, whether it's, you know, whether it's this year or the next couple of months or, or next year, I think, you know, there, there's a good reason to, to be pretty bullish on, on that news. Um, it just gives access to the entire traditional market uh, in a way that, you know, hasn't been available uh, previously, particularly when you think about, you know, retirement accounts and, um, you know, 401ks and IRAs and things like that. It's just it's still there, there's still a lot of sort of operational burden, uh, you know, obstacles to be able to enter this market for the average investor. Now, I mean, I know there's a lot of people out there with, you know, Coinbase accounts and different uh, retail brokerage accounts. But um, I think this allows, you know, you can imagine a world where. Uh, a year or two from now, every target date fund that everybody's using in their retirement account has a small allocation uh, to 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 Bitcoin or to crypto because of the you know benefits of diversification and and uncorrelated to to the rest of the market. So I think it was you know um, a, a good signal for for what we can expect uh, when things do move forward there. Well, you mentioned the dark side of the space, which is the R word, which is regulation. It seems like we can't get out of the, an episode of this show without talking about, especially for a firm aimed at your side of the space. They obviously have to be focused on the regulatory side. So as a startup aimed squarely at institutions, what are your thoughts on the kind of the regulatory landscape we're seeing for crypto here in the U.S.? Obviously, a lot of it is kind of regulation by enforcement right now. Not a lot of clarification. I think a lot of people would love a little bit more of the latter. But does it give you confidence out here going forward that you're going to be able to proceed and grow and build a business in these marketplaces? Or are you maybe a little bit concerned that, you know, the worm might turn at any moment and make it much more challenging for you? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's obviously something that we keep a close eye on. Uh, m- most most of our focus is, is XUS right now, just because of that regulatory uncertainty. And, um, you know, with all, all the issues in, uh, you know, in DC uh, today, there's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's unfortunate, but, but a reality that things are just going to move slow, more slowly here um, than than in other jurisdictions, but I do think you know a lot of encouraging headlines uh, from Europe, um, you know spots in spots in Asia, uh, LATAM, and then of course the Middle East. So I think you're you're seeing uh, frameworks and templates that are being established uh, for good regulatory um, you know guidelines and things that the the U.S. once we do. I know there's some bills uh, that are sort of stuck in the pipelines in, in Congress, but um, I think we'll eventually we'll eventually get there, and so we're building for that world in the future, but. In the meantime, yeah, it's been it's been pretty tough because there's there isn't a ton of, of regulatory clarity around you know what what assets are okay to trade, what instruments, things like that. So um, so it's been tough, but I think you know hopefully within the next year or two, uh, the U.S. will catch up to um, to other developed market, to other developed financial markets, and um, you know maintain its leadership in in capital markets in general. So I'm optimistic. I think we'll get there, but it's a it's a long meandering road for sure. That would be nice. I'm, I'm tired of bringing on guests, David, from Asia and Europe and them gloating at their uh, much more welcoming, shall we say, regulatory environment and 
us yep. here in the U.S. Usually the vanguard for this kind of thing, and we're uh, definitely lagging behind. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's un it's unfortunate that that's the case. I think it's just a consequence, a little bit of our you know political environment and the divisiveness and everything. But uh, but I think we'll. I, I do I do believe we'll get there and, and catch up. But uh, but yeah, in the meantime, plenty of opportunity around the world. And that's the nice part about this asset class is that it is truly, truly global. Speaking of opportunities, you mentioned you're firmly entrenched in the spot markets for right now. Obviously, our audience also dips their toes in the derivative space. You said you're eyeballing some potentially interesting products and opportunities on the crypto derivative side. Still very much a nascent area of the space, a lot of room to run and to explore over there. So from your perspective, what parts of the uh, crypto derivatives world do you find intriguing? Where are the opportunities for you at Enclave on the derivative side? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that this is an underserved uh, part of the market. And part of that is, you know, just related to, to, to the last topic we talked about uh, around regulation. But um, I, I think that, the, you know, if you think about the institutional markets in, in other asset classes, really the way that they developed and sort of uh, took a majority of the market share where it wasn't just sort of like retail trading, you know, stocks, for example, uh, was the ability to sort of be uh, market neutral or, or delta neutral. Um, and the way the best way to do that is through the use of, uh, of different types of derivatives. And so I, I think one of the reasons that hasn't you know, developed as much is because you don't have the same uh, you know, traditional prime brokerage banks uh, involved in crypto, you know, particularly in the U.S. or even in Europe uh, yet. Uh, but I think that that will come. And then um, you're going to be able to have different types of strategies. So for example, in the you know, quantitative world, there's a lot of signals that you can trade, but it requires the ability to, to sort of be market neutral or, or delta neutral. And the way that you uh, affect that is through derivatives. And so uh, my, my view is that that's a huge growth area. Uh, we're sort of, um, you know, we're, we're sort of experimenting with different things and, and uh, observing the market. Uh, and then figuring out, you know, what, what is the right jurisdiction to, you know, to do that in. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I personally think that that is going to be a huge growth area, uh, particularly on the institutional side, but also just for the market in general um, to be able to, to hedge your risk, essentially. Well, David, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to join us here on the Crypto Hot Seat. We have to keep on rolling with the program. A lot to break down here with Bitcoin and ETH moving all over the place. But before we do that, we kind of just touched on some of the interesting derivatives opportunities you see. What else can folks look forward to coming down the pike from Enclave Markets? And also, if they're intrigued, they want to learn more about what you're up to, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, no, absolutely. That would be great. Um, so we're, we're, on, uh, we're on Twitter, X, uh, whatever you want to call it, at uh, Enclave Markets, at Enclave Markets. And then uh, our website's very easy. It's just enclave.market. So definitely check us out there. You can find our you know, API docs if you're an API trader. Uh, there's a lot more information about our different uh, our different products, but uh, but yeah, we're we're firm believers in in more sort of you know differentiated, sophisticated marketplaces, uh, particularly on the OTC side. And so we're we're looking we're we're sort of have a a first mover advantage and a bit of a, a market leadership on uh, the confidential trading aspect of it. It's tied to our value proposition of the fully encrypted exchange um, and having the you know fully compliant but private trades. And so we'll we'll be looking to expand those offerings. Um, you know different types of assets, different types of uh, order types. And then from a uh, just sort of like an ecosystem perspective, we're, we're talking to all the different sort of infrastructure providers, whether it's smart order routers, you know, wallet providers or custodians, um, different types of uh, prime brokers and, and, and OTC desks out there. Uh, we'd love to be integrated with sort of all these different players to, to reduce the, you know, the, the barrier to be able to sort of trade in our marketplace. So that's what we're focused on right now. All right, listeners, you can check them out over there at Enclave.Markets or Enclave Markets with an S, all one word, on the old Twitter out there. And, David, we'll make sure we'll check in with you guys down the road and see how all these institutional crypto initiatives that we discussed here, how they're unfolding in the marketplace in the coming months. That sounds great. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. Appreciate it. All right, and now it's time, listeners, to keep on rolling. It is time to get the Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trending activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown. Man, a lot to break down this week. And at least so far, it doesn't seem like a head fake. It seems like we're hanging out above 30K, at least for right now. So I'll bury the lead no longer, listeners. Uh, Bitcoin rocking and rolling out there this week when we kicked off the show. Just a wee bit shy of 31,000, 30,904 to be precise. A wee bit higher than when we left you last week, listeners, at 28,538. It puts us up about 2,300 
and 66 handles on the week. The high, of course, coming earlier this morning, 31 to 80. So we did get a little bit north of 31K before retreating back below it a little bit. Uh, the low coming right after our show last week, 27, 130. Uh, so we actually had a pretty decent range, over 4,100 handles on the week out there. So impressive range. All that probably factoring into what we're seeing out there from a vol and a skew front. Remember, if you want to see all this data for yourselves in much more detail, we really just scratched the surface here on the show. Then head on over to Amber Data, A-M-B-E-R-D-A-T-A dot I-O, the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. If you did that, if you fired it up and saw the 30-day vol, which again is kind of the gold standard for volatility. It's what everyone really looks at when they're looking at volatility. It's that front month 30-day volatility is looking juicy right now. Back up to not quite a 50, but pretty close. 47 and a half when we kicked off the show. Puts it up from 35.6 where it was this time last week. So a nice little pop out here. About 12 points almost on the vol front. Which again is nice because we were talking not too long ago. Remember I said on the show, listeners, when Bitcoin and ETH vol both drifted into the mid to high 20s. I said then, this seems like a fairly anemic vol level. Certainly, maybe an intriguing time to get long some premium if you reticent about blasting away on that premium, perhaps. And here we are back almost not quite 2x from those levels, but pretty darn close to it. Let's go a little bit farther down the chain, see what's cooking. Let's say six months out, listeners. And the vol there also up, almost up 10 points. That's a big move for six month vol. We were a little bit north of 45 on the last show, 45.3 coming in to start today's show, 55. So up 10 points across the board. All this. Showing you, A, a lot of vol popping in there. And also, again, Bitcoin kind of moves to the beat of its own drummer. If you're used to markets rallying in the equity space and vol coming in aggressively like we're seeing out there today, then crypto space may come as a bit of a surprise to you. But that's why we talk about the skew here on this show as well. And usually that skew is biased to the upside, especially longer term, which means as we go up, that vol is going to increase, listeners. That's pretty much exactly what we're seeing out there right now. Of course, the violence of the movement this week also helped add a little bit of juice out there this week, but intriguing stuff. Nonetheless, speaking of skew, let's get out there and see how it's, how it's shaping up this week. We'll start in the weeklies and move our way out. Uh, seven day skew listeners. It was starting to lean positive this time last week. It was still about positive one and a half. Some of that, of course, the resident afterglow from all the drama this week, firmly in the green, a positive six this week. So the bulls back in charge, at least on the weekly front on the skew side of Bitcoin. Let's go out about a month last week. The 30-day skew was exactly flat. There was no bias in any direction last week. This week, again, looking bullish, uh, almost a six, about a five and a half. Again, that just means we're about five and a half points worth of premium to the 25 Delta calls versus the 25 Delta puts. If you don't understand any of that, then make sure you're checking out the full network. Let's go a little bit longer term. Let's go out six months, see what's cooking out there. That's usually biased to the upside, historically speaking, in the Bitcoin realm, and that is the case again this week. It was a positive 5.1 on the show last week. This week, nearly a positive 8, positive 7.8. So a decent swing out there as well. Uh, speaking of decent swings, also seeing a decent swing on the OI front over there on Deribit. More people piling in to uh, the options over there. The calls, almost a quarter of a million open now, about 243,000. That's up about 28,000. Maybe not as much as you might think, but also remember, as we're blowing through strikes to the upside, some folks are taking some calls off as well. So it's not all new opening paper. Puts also growing this week as well, which is interesting on an upside week. Puts back up over 100,000. 103,000 contracts open on the put front on Deribit, to be precise. That's up 13,000 from this time last week. Let's get out to a product I know a lot of you are interested in. Certainly a lot more of you right now than there were, let's say, a couple of weeks ago. It's Bitto threatening a 16 as we kicked off the show. It's up 1.2 points from where it was last week. And from the last couple of weeks, it's up quite a bit, obviously. Uh, the ADV also surging as well. So go figure. You folks really love Bitto when, when Bitcoin is frothy. Again, it's kind of like the institutional demand I was talking about with David earlier in the crypto hot seat. Very highly correlated to the price of Bitcoin. Bitto obviously is as well, not just from a price perspective, but also from a demand perspective. People obviously want it a lot more and they want to trade the options a lot more when Bitcoin's looking a little bit frothier. Uh, that ADV reflecting that, 22,000 contracts is the ADV right now. It's up 6,000, so nice pop. Obviously down from the nearly 100,000 contracts it was uh, not too long ago, but also looking a lot more respectable out there. Uh, speaking of respectable, the vol looking frothy out there. The vol is looking pretty juicy out there right now. At about a 39, 
That puts it up about, oh, four handles from where it was this time last week. And in terms of the action, a lot of action out there. Before we get to that, let's break down the top positions. Let's do a top five in Biddle right now because it's fun to watch the evolution. Coming at number five right now, listeners, we have 29,000 of the Jan 20s. Number four, 41, almost 42,000 of the Jan 2025, so longer term calls. And these are on the 25 strikes, so a lot of 25s there, 42,000 of those. Number three, 65,000 of the Jan 2025 35s. Number two, 68,000 of the regular Jan 65 calls. And the number one size position in Bitto options right now, 85,000 of the Jan 2025 30 calls. So optimistic upside, to put it mildly. Uh, let's keep on rolling. Obviously, we don't know if they're buying or selling those listeners. And if past is prologue, a lot of this upside on the crypto front is traditionally buying. Let's go out to the action that's lighting it up today. It looks like the big dog today are the Jan 65. So once again, those lighting it up, and they are the number two overall size position in terms of total open interest as well. So interesting that that strike lighting it up again today. 8,600 trading today, uh, followed by number two. We have 5,500 of the 15 half puts expiring this week. So getting back to some near-dated stuff. And also about 5,000 of the 16 calls also expiring this week. So 15 half puts, 16 calls right around where we're trading right now. In fascinating stuff out there. Let's see if we can find some more fascinating paper as we explore the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe. All right, everybody, let's do it. Let's explore the rest of the crypto markets. Let's explore the altcoin universe. Let's kick it off looking at a top 10 from a market cap perspective, see what evolution we can find out there this week. Cost you just a little bit north of $8 billion to break into the top 10 this week. That still gets you to Tron. So Tron hanging out at the number 10 spot for a while. Number nine, our good friend Doge kicked down from the number eight spot not too long ago. Doge a little bit north of $9 billion for the number nine spot. Number eight, it's Cardano. Almost nine and a half, about $9.4 billion worth of market cap out there. Number seven, Solana. 12, about 12 and a quarter billion out there this week. Number six, USD. It's a good old 25.4 billion. Number five, XRP. 28 and a half billion. It's looking a little bit frothier this week. Number four, BNB, 33, almost 33 and a half billion. Number three, it's Tether. It's 84.2 billion. Number two, it's ETH, 203 billion. And the number one big dog out there, of course, is Bitcoin. Let's get out to the number two from a market cap. Number one in a lot of your hearts, of course, it is ETH. And again, looking frothy as we kick off the show. Uh, nearly 1,700, 1,692 when we kicked off the show. Puts it 109 handles to the upside from where it was this time last week. The high coming earlier this morning, we did kiss that 1,700 level, 1,703 to be precise, right before showtime. And the low coming last Thursday, actually. Uh, once again, just like Bitcoin, ball looking a little bit frothier, a little bit juicier out there. A full 10 points to the upside on the 30-day vol. We were at a 30 this time last week and exactly a 40 when we kicked off the show this week. Vol getting juicier. All we needed was a little bit of upside to juice things up out here, listeners. Go a little bit farther out. Let's go out six months down the curve and same deal. In fact, impressive numbers there as well. It was a 41.8 on the show this time last week. This week, almost a 50, 49 and a quarter. That's a pretty big jump for six-month vol. Doesn't usually move that much, but again, Shows you what we're seeing out there on the ETH vol front. Let's look at the skew. No surprise that the skew has swung to the upside, to the positive, to the bullish as well. Last week, the seven-day skew, the weekly skew, was decidedly bearish. Negative three, about negative 3.1, actually. Coming into the start of the show this week, a positive five. So that's more than eight points in the other direction this week. Let's go out to the 30-day skew. Skew last week, listeners, was about a negative four and a quarter. And that has swung... Pretty much almost exactly in the opposite direction. This is now at a, almost a positive 4, a positive uh, 3.9. So a pretty sizable swing. The right direction, at least if you're a bull, in the positive direction out there this week. Let's, let's go a little bit farther out, 180 days. Decent little move there as well. It was a little bit north of positive 2, about positive 2 and a quarter. Coming in the start of this week, almost a positive 4, about positive 3. Point. Not quite as aggressive as what we saw. Bitcoin, but impressive stuff nonetheless. Uh, in terms of action on the OI front, listeners, uh, kind of interesting out there. Uh, actually seeing ETH OI come in a little bit. 2.53 million contracts open. It's actually down 70,000 contracts. Remember, as you're blown through strikes to the upside, like I was saying with Bitcoin, 
uh, quite frequently, we will see people take those off. They'll take their profits and run. It's been a little while outside of the aberrant move from last week. It's been a little while since we saw some stained upside in Bitcoin. So maybe some folks were, were hungry for some upside profits and they were taking them off the second they could get them. Either way, uh, 70,000 contracts coming off the top on the call side this week. Meanwhile, the puts continuing to grow. 925,000 puts open on Dare right now. It's up about 59, almost 60,000 contracts uh, from this time last week. All right, let's run through some of the rest of the altcoin universe, and we'll get out of here for this week, listeners. Let's go out to Solana. It was a 23.65 last week, 29.42 this week. My goodness. That's a little bit north of five and three quarters pop to the upside, so a big run here for Solana. XRP, 49.5 last week, 53.3 this week, so up about 3.7, almost four cents to the upside this week. A good old Doge, a little bit of a lift, 5.9 cents last week, half a cent out there. Cardano, a little bit of a pop. Unfortunately, no crypto Lambos on the show this week. That is going to do it for the crypto rundown this week. I want to thank our guest, David Wells from Enclave Markets, for joining us in the crypto hot seat. Want to check them out, learn more. It's enclave.market, singular, or enclave markets, all one word and plural. Plural, plural on the Twitter as well. That's well. going to do it for us on the network today. Back again tomorrow with a great pro Q&A with a huge crypto fan. And then coming back on Wednesday for all you educational folks, Options Boot Camp coming in hot and heavy. You should be checking that show out on the On Demand. At least Thursday, of course, this week in Futures Options, a show that does touch on Bitcoin and ETH occasionally. So check that one out as well as, of course, on the Option Block Friday, Volatility Views. Then we're back again for all you pro folks on Options Oddities. Then we're back again next week, another episode of the Crypto Rundown. Stay safe out there. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>